Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Smells Like Business, a podcast for anyone who wants to learn more about the current and future state of cannabis in Europe. Every episode we talk to different business owners and cannabis specialists, making it easier for you to enter and better understand the cannabis industry. On this episode, we have Brett Puffenbarger from Vanguard Scientific on the show. And yes, in case you were wondering, that is his real name. We discuss a wide range of topics such as Vanguard Scientific and what it is Brett does there, how Brett managed to transfer himself and his skill sets over into the cannabis industry, how the industry is developing in the US and what Europe can learn from that, as well as how to position and prepare yourself as best as possible to enter the industry. We release an episode every other Friday, and this episode just happened to land on Christmas Day. So I think it's safe to say that this is the Christmas special. So we here at Smells Like Business would love to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And if you're feeling festive and in a giving mood, then please do rate us or give us a review on iTunes. So without further ado, let's commence. All right. Hi, Brett. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? doing great and thanks for having me it's a real honor to be on this podcast ah well it's an honor to have you and a pleasure as well but yes let's maybe start by telling us a little bit about vanguard scientific the company you work for so what is it they do exactly so i think the easiest way to put what we do is that we're end-to-end solutions and systems providers mainly focused in the botanical extraction space and specifically for hemp and cannabis And to unpack that a little bit, our main focus is that we sell our own proprietary extraction and terpene fractionation equipment. And then we have a whole host of other products from other companies that we've run through what we call our science and technology review board. And basically what we do is we go in and we validate every piece of it, assess it for its readiness for upregulation, assess it for its readiness and the ability to do what it says it's going to do. And then we bring it into our portfolio. And then something we've more recently rolled out is that we have this end-to-end solutions where we can help clients kind of from back of the napkin all the way through to the review process of lab facility design and layout, technical assistance reports, fire code and safety. So our kind of goal is, or our going tagline is that, you know, quality is our culture and it's mostly focused in that processing and extraction space. Okay. And I guess if you're trying to facilitate what works for these people, it's quite nice. You've got quite a large portfolio of different equipment. Yeah, we mainly focus in ethanol and CO2 extraction and then the post-processing. So the filtration, the distillation, the isolation that follows. And we're actually finding a huge chunk of that kind of legacy hydrocarbon market for the United States that's starting to jump over because of the levels of quality, taste, flavor, Stuff like that that used to be in canna world regulated to that legacy market is now being caught up with and surpassed by the CO2 and ethanol side of the market. And kind of like science has finally overtaken art, if you will, when it comes to those things. Because a lot of the times, and this is something we talk about at Vanguard, extraction is not that different than cooking. It is an art form, but it's an art form based in science. Mm -hmm. So for us, we're really trying to meld those two worlds where you know, you can put your own personal panache on it. You can have your own specific formulations, but the science is going to be sound that got you there. The process is going to be Loctite in step, ready to upregulate if necessary, and still give you that kind of free artistic reign to get that specific terpene profile for flavor or effect. An art form based on science. I like that. And it makes sense because with extraction, there's a certain methodology that you have to follow. But like you said, with the science, you can really bring out these terpenes and these different taste profiles. So I guess that's where the artistic side of the science comes out. So what is it you do for them? So I know you are the director of digital marketing and sales integration. So what does that actually entail? So a big part of my job is putting in this inbound sales model with a content marketing focus, meaning we're not going out there and jamming down people's doors and beating down the, you know, the walls to say, hey, work with us. We're mostly based out of referral business and we're putting out free information to help the industry as a whole. And we're putting it out there in a way that allows people to go, hey, that works. Can you help me? 
rather than really kind of forcing them down this path. And that's been something that I've been driving since taking up this position at Vanguard and something that Vanguard believed in before. So it's really been like a melding of forces toward let's help people understand from an educational perspective, from a very, you know, we use the term hands down approach of no, we're bringing an offer. I'm not trying to sell you. If I am, it's just because these are the things that'll get you to where you want to be. And we very much focus on, for me, it's helping our team provide those sort of services where we go, hey, we're going to meet you where you are, not where we want you to be. And we're going to help get you to where you want to be based on your challenges, goals and plans. It's pretty much that simple. And what about when it comes to advertising? Because I know that's not so simple. In Europe, it's still quite difficult to advertise cannabis and cannabis related products. So you have to think a little bit outside the box. Is that the same case for you guys over in the US? Yeah, very much so. So I think the first part to talk about as far as advertising in cannabis or CBD and hemp is that a large chunk of advertising now is done through social media and all of the major social media companies or formats still have very archaic rules in place regarding cannabis and CBD. So we're very much kind of relegated to this must be educational, activism, political, something that very squarely falls into Uh, what we would call in the United States, like a free speech area of like, these are the most sacred and protected things. And then when you're looking at traditional advertising, that in the States is probably just as varied as it will be as Europe stands up, meaning that you could take a state like Florida, no advertising is loud at all, no billboards, no radio, no TV, it's all word of mouth and a little bit of kind of creative social media using influencers. But even that's more or less going away in the very near future. And I would say something like that is probably more than likely in a large chunk of countries moving forward as far as like Europe and the rest of the world comes on board. And even in the states or the countries where we have seen it be allowed, they eventually rescind on that. So like California is currently going through a couple of different sets of lawsuits or discussions where Even the people within the industry are saying, hey, we shouldn't be advertising on billboards. We should fall into something more along the lines of alcohol or tobacco. And then you have the other side. And it's one of those instances where, from my perspective, quite often the cannabis and hemp space is a united front. We are pushing for similar things, even if we have different approaches. This is one of those very niche parts of it where I think we are fractioned a little bit and we do have some differences of opinion because some people are, oh, we're ready to go now, you know, like screw the stigma. Let's do it. Let's get over it. Let's push past it and just start talking over their heads. And another set is sitting back going, wait, 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 wait. Maybe we should start with the broken things like Indica Sativa Hybrid and approach this from an educational spot with true science. So, you know, pushing toward terpene profiles over Indica Sativa Hybrid, pushing for, hey guys, the race for the highest THC count isn't the race for the appropriate or most efficacious parts of this. And it kind of goes full circle with that as far as like, it really depends on how an individual market falls as to how you have to approach it. But there are approaches that we've kind of have to figure out in the States that I'm hoping will work in Europe as it continues to roll out. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine it can be a bit frustrating or difficult at times, but I guess it also forces you to take this educational stance on the whole approach as well, which is maybe a blessing in disguise. I like it. At the end of the day, I think I would prefer to sell into an educated, hungry environment than I would a bunch of people that are confused and running around. And I'm sure I'm the black sheep of the family of marketers and sales guys in the cannabis space saying that because a lot of the times that isn't the easiest road to sow, but it's the road that will lead, in my opinion, to a longevity for the market. Way past my time in the market, way past your time, you know, to me, if we set the education now, it will work for us in the future because we've seen the opposite. The stigma has stayed with us even beyond the science, the information being out there. I would posit that it would happen in the reverse too. So to me, it is one of those things where, yeah, we're having to get creative now. We're having to take a different approach. But on the other side of that, is it really in the end forcing us to do the right thing? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. And I just keep coming back to it, the importance of education, because here in Europe especially, cannabis still has quite a bad rep and a strong stigma attached to it. 
So yeah, we really do need to inform the masses of all the wonderful benefits and attributes this plant has. Yeah, and also I have a bit of a funny question for you. So I noticed it's quite a big team. So I can imagine the company is doing well and obviously growing. But I did notice there are a couple of suspicious looking names, yours included. I do know that your name, Brett Puffenbarger, is your actual name. But I did see there were two other names that stuck out as being slightly suspicious. That was Michael Budd and, <laughs> and Nicholas Herbst. Now, I have to ask, are those their actual names? That is everybody's actual name. Wow. That is everybody's on their driver's license, birth certificates, you name it. Mike and I actually make up a, a good chunk of the marketing team and, and do a large chunk of the marketing for Vanguard. And we laugh about it all the time. Like, uh, we're going to rename the marketing department the Puffin Bud Advertising Agency or something <laughs> like that, because it's just too good. I'd never noticed with Nick, but you're right. It says Herbs right in his name. Yeah, Nick Herbst. I mean, there's three of you. Just from the names alone, it sounds like a dream team. So, you know, <laughs> great names, especially for the cannabis industry. But yeah, so how did you actually end up working for Vanguard? Was it through someone or did you apply for a job or were you headhunted? And how did that all happen? The power of LinkedIn, my mm, friend. Nice. So I, I am a huge fan of LinkedIn. I don't think anybody in the world of cannabis on LinkedIn doesn't know that already. But I think something that people would be interested in is, I, I know I touched on a little bit ago, all social media hates cannabis except LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been or seen a rebirth or a growth or a renaissance of cannabis, they've gone so far as to allow cannabis as a job skill. They're allowing us to openly post about it in all sorts of ways that the other social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, don't allow. And so for me, I kind of lucked out. It wasn't some grand strategic plan, but I started being active on LinkedIn and thinking, man, this works. You know, I'm not seeing any resistance as far as community standards or getting banned or, or any of those things that we see for pages and, and people outside of LinkedIn. So getting to Vanguard was real simple. I had been in the industry about five years. I had a decent reputation. I had a growing following on LinkedIn. And I, uh, I guess I took the hands down approach we were talking about. And I, I made a post about, you know, hey, uh, I sold out my shares of my old company. I'm a free agent. Who wants me? Who wants me? Come get me. <laughs> Basically, yeah. And uh, the guys at Vanguard, or specifically the girls, our corporate controller just commented. All she did was tag our HR lady. And uh, the rest was kind of history. You know, a couple interviews later, I got to meet the CEO, my current supervisor, the vice president of marketing. And a few other people, and we just kind of went from there. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah. So for anyone out there who wants to get into the world of cannabis, LinkedIn is definitely a good way of networking. And obviously, in your case, getting a job as well. So uh, well done there. All right. So what I'm very curious to know is how you ended up getting yourself and also establishing yourself in the cannabis industry. So perhaps you could paint us a picture and tell us what you were doing before you got into the world of cannabis. And then how you transitioned, or in your words, transplanted yourself into the cannabis industry. I'm glad you used that. So for me, you know, I'm a small town kid from Virginia, very rural lifestyle growing up, joined the Marine Corps straight out of high school, did five years running around the world, touring everything, doing military things. And when I got out, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I bought a karate school. And I know this is going to sound like one of those weird left turns. You bought one. Okay, wow. Yep. So uh, I did that for a little bit and I didn't like it, but I really learned sales and it was something that I enjoyed. And I'd been an avid Harley rider my entire life. So I eventually worked my way into a sales position at Harley, worked myself up to be the director of business development. And around that time, I discovered cannabis as a human being. Like, obviously, I had known about weed and, and, you know, bong rips and things in high school. I think every American or probably European teenager has at least had some level of exposure to that. Mm hmm. It wasn't really in my world. And, you know, I'll be entirely transparent. I got into a fight with my ex and she said something along the lines of, I hear veterans do really great on weed. You should smoke a joint. And I said, you know, maybe I will. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, to not be too cavalier about it, but kind of the rest was history. So I... Uh, How old were you at the time? 25, 26, mid 20s. Okay. You know, so... I guess you would call it a legacy market medicated for a little bit. And as Florida became legal, I decided to make the jump. 
We have uh, what's called forced vertical integration in Florida. So we only have companies that grow, process, package, and dispense under one license as one large corporation. So I got a job at one of those here in Florida, and I only worked there a little bit. You know, we got their first four stores open, got them up and running, and then I got my first taste of something that I tell everybody, you know, cannabis is a unique industry in that it's normal like everything else. It's a consumer packaged good and agricultural product, but it's also a boom industry or a boom economy. And I, I have a little phrase that I throw out there pretty regularly and cavalierly that grass attracts snakes. Mm. And I mean that, yeah, you get exactly where I'm going with that. So I don't really need to dig into it. So I got my very first experience of that, left them along with seven other people. It was kind of a great compliance purge. And something to kind of throw out there for listeners as they come into the industry. The average person I read recently in cannabis has three jobs in their first year. But once they've landed on one, most of them stay for three to five years and see an exponential growth in title responsibility and otherwise. So while there is a huge amount of initial churn for most people finding their footing, normally, if they can kind of weather that for a little bit, it can become a stalwart industry for them or a big chunk of their experience. You know what I mean? And it's a little more common in the industry. So for me, I landed with Buds for Vets as their director of public relations. Our specialty was getting veterans their cannabis cards for free. So we covered the doctor's appointments and got them set up for things. I loved that until uh, I decided to come back to the for-profit world was part of founding Florida's first full-service hemp consulting company, and then sold out my chunks of that after a while and found myself in the COVID chaos and then Vanguard. Oh, yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so you definitely worked your way up. Yeah, I saw that Buds for Vets. That's a, a really great initiative and charity. But yes, I noticed that you have been involved in a lot of firsts. You were the general manager for the first dispensary in Florida, Knox Medical. You also helped create Florida's first co-branded product. So do you think having planted yourself early on in the industry helped you build your cannabis career? Very, very, very much. And something I, I tell a lot of people, you know, something I do on the side that has nothing to do with work or anything is I try to bring people into the industry in the best way possible because I lucked out and I had a really, really good mentor with a huge amount of experience in the business world and the operations world who really took me under his wing. And funny enough, he was another veteran. So he was a Navy guy. I'm a Marine Corps guy. We kind of spoke the same language. And so I've tried to put myself in a position where I can help people like that, too. So some of the things I tell people when they jump in the industry, A, everybody in this industry is a transplant. If you go back five, 10 years, None of these people were around not in the cannabis space. They were doing something else. All of us were. But on the other side of that coin is, is that all of the people who are transplanting in the industry are bringing skills from such a broad, vast array of industries and experience that we're really getting to benefit as an industry from a larger collective knowledge pool than any other industry. You know, we've got consumer packaged goods, we've got spirits, we've got pharma, we've got agriculture, we've got retail, we've got big tech company marketing, you name it. People are transplanting into the industry quickly. You know, once we got whatever deemed an essential service and continue moving forward in that way, and it's continued to grow since, it's just this wave of knowledge. And I think people don't realize that necessarily when they're jumping in. They think, oh man, cannabis is so different. And while it is, you know, we have our unique state by state laws or country by country laws. At the end of the day, I can't help but always revert back to guys, it's a consumer packaged goods product. And we have collective knowledge that you don't have to be 10 years in the cannabis space or five years in the cannabis space to really be able to plant your flag. And especially as for you guys in Europe, as countries come on board, it's like a different scale than what we've seen. You know, you guys, you have people like me who lucked out in a single state and I have a bunch of firsts in Florida. That gives me a unique perspective. But that same thing happens over and over and over. We've got, what, 38 legal states? Well, there's at least 38 people just like me that have been through the same process. you know. And as Europe happens, more and more will get built on top of that. And the other kind of byline to that is, I tell everybody when they come into cannabis, it's like dog years. Cannabis experience grows exponentially and quicker because we are a more chaotic and fast-paced industry. So that first year... 
is really like a three to five year crash course kind of slammed into the first year. And if you're capable of, uh, in Vanguard world, we say drinking from a fire hose and just kind of taking it in and capturing as much as you can, you're going to do so much better. And, you know, I've seen both sides of that coin where really experienced people have jumped in and weren't quite prepared for it and they've left. And I've seen other people who had no idea what they were getting into and they relish in it. So for me, it's realizing that there's a goal at the end, anybody coming in, realizing that their experience is valid the second they come in, and then being willing to basically mainline information for that first year. And you're just as ready, just as prepared as anybody else setting foot in the industry. Full stop. Full stop. Yeah. And I also noticed that you did a course on dispensary tech and online management for cannabis businesses. How was that? And did you find it helpful and useful? So I think things like that are very, very helpful and useful. So when I did it, it was very much the beginnings of the industry. And I actually have spoken to the guy running the program that I took back then, and things have evolved a lot. You know, I I think there could be many debates made about formalized education, the need for a degree, the need for advanced degrees, even graduate school, things like that. But I think when it comes to cannabis specifically, if you really want to be able to, I guess the best way to put it is filter that drinking from a fire hose, something like that, uh, whether it's from Learn Sativa or Oaksterdam or Cannabis Training University or Green Flower or any of a host of them, to me, that gives people the baseline cannabis knowledge that they need to pair with whatever their specialty is to really be effective. You know what I mean? So something like that will teach them little things that they may think are foreign words to us right now. Endocannabinoid, cannabis, terpene, limonene, you know, these very kind of foreign sounding medical terms or very scientific terms are actually really simple concepts, you know, plant compounds. Oh, cool. Everybody knows that. Or everybody knows essential oils and and things like that can give that baseline education in a very short amount of time for not a huge amount of money that you can't find anywhere else other than kind of that school of hard knocks. So for me, it was a really good way back then to go like, okay, These are terpenes. These are the things we're talking about. This is the science and how it works with the body. And this is all the words we use in the industry. And it was kind of that crash course. So I would recommend that for almost anybody, unless they're a lifetime advocate or a lifetime activist or a lifetime user who's very familiar with the culture and the language that we use in the legacy market all the way through to the current market. It's a great way to kind of catch up, if you will, because there's only so much there. Once you have those baseline, like probably 25 phrases down and you kind of understand how to speak the language, it routes me right back to we're just a consumer packaged good, just an agricultural, just a pharma or nutraceutical product, depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So understand the plant, get to know the plant, do that crash course, and then you can take whatever your skills are and bring it into the industry. Okay, I would say that's very good advice. So you've been in the industry now for five plus years. What's your take on how the industry has developed and is developing in the US? Overall, I think we're moving forward. If I, if I had to give that 30,000 foot view how the US is progressing, we're getting there. We're getting there slowly and we're making a whole lot of mistakes to get there the right way. Now, if I want to break that down or unpack that a little more, we are seeing a massive uptick in money lobbying and effort pushed toward what's called forced vertical integration, meaning a very small select group of license holders get to do all of it from end to end. Grow, extract, package, produce, sell. See to sale. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So when we're looking at this, you see a state like Oklahoma. They've opened up and basically said for six grand or something, You can have as many licenses as you want. You can try to do all the things you want. And they've kind of put this true competition in place. And they have hundreds of licenses vying for lots of different things. And yes, that's very dog eat dog and capitalistic. And and that has its negatives. But it's given an opportunity for truly good ideas and true entrepreneurship and people to jump into the industry. On the other side of that coin, you have a state like Florida who put in a forced vertical integration with a 30 year time span of needing to be a nursery with 60, I think it was 60 grand for the application. You had to have $5 million in the bank, $10 million liquid, yada, 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 yada. Oh, wow. Like, right. So there's these massive barriers to entry. 
And I think if we're looking at that, so you can kind of bucket it into the force vertical or the highly verticalized states, to me, are succeeding if you're just looking at stock valuations. But to me, it's kind of like the glass cannon analogy or like, uh, you know, the paper champion analogy of like, they're doing really, really well in their specific market. And in, as long as they can continue to keep control and kind of funnel everybody to their same few groups, those will eventually, from my perspective, crack and fail. Not because vertical integration isn't capable of being done. I think there are plenty of people who can go into a what we call a horizontal market and have the full competition and they can dominate each chunk of the supply chain and do it right. I'm specifically talking about when there is no true competition, when you only have 11 licenses for 300,000 patients, or you only have four licenses for 100,000 patients, where there is no kind of incentive to compete, there is no incentive for true customer service, there is no even incentive for things that to me, in my compliance-minded, quality is our culture mindset, should be the baseline, you know, multi-level, several-tier testing for more than just cannabinoid profiles, for more than just the kind of basic heavy metals and stuff. And you don't see that in these forced vertical markets. So then you kind of have this other side of these vertical operators who make huge stock returns, but we can see it in the overall market of acreage, canopy, medmen. Eventually they crack and it doesn't work because they actually have to face true competition. So I think we're seeing two things. We're seeing a struggling market that will eventually lead to longevity, and we're seeing a thriving market that will fizzle out very quickly. Bit of a cautionary tale for Europe there. And how do you think the green rush affected this in the US and Canada? Do you think it has had a big impact on the industry? And do you think there's any lessons that have been learned from, for instance, the gold rush or the dot-com boom? Very, very, very much so. So I'll kind of split that into a couple of different answers. I think the rush toward the green rush or the fact that it's a boom economy has kind of bifurcated the industry into the legacy guys who managed to make enough money to survive. And then what most West Coast cannabis people would refer to as chads. So like someone who's very much from like retail or real estate or law and they come in and they know how to run business, but they all kind of take this approach of, well, it's weed, it'll sell itself. And while that is true to some degree, it's not. So what we've kind of seen is this whole grass attracts snakes thing has come about, where you kind of have two separate industries vying for control. You have one who seems to have the ear of most politicians and has a lot of money, but no true grassroots support. And then you have the other side who actually interacts with and helps out the patient block or the consumer block, but they don't have the inherent capital funding to push, but they're making enough to survive. So we kind of have these two sides to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, sounds like they're completely opposite ends of the spectrum. They truly are. And, and it's kind of interesting to watch that happen. It's like watching two different plays play out in front of you at the same time, and you're just hoping that they meet back in the middle it's like, well, eventually these two are going to have to meet where the money will have to go with the legacy guys building sustainability. But what happens to the other side of this equation when that happens or vice versa? If they dump enough money into the one side, what happens to this legacy small grower horizontally integrated set of things? Yeah, interesting. But yeah, of course, everything's happened so fast. So I can imagine certain decisions or regulations were made quite hastily. I mean, are you happy that things have changed and moved forward so quickly, or are you more of the mindset that slow and steady might have been the way to go? I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest, and I hate to be that middle of the road guy. I think that there is all sorts of reasons to push this very fast and move very quickly from one step to the next step to the next step, because let's call it like it is. We should have never been in this position to begin with. It should have never been Schedule 1 in the United States. It should never have been whatever they use for the EU uh, schedule four to be the baddest or whatever it is like, it should have never been like that. So I understand the want to just jump the gun and go to that. But I think on the other side of that is we can learn lessons from the gold rush and the green rush and from prohibition of alcohol in the United States to kind of look at these things. So like right now we could take Florida, for example, 
we have medical use, we have a forced vertical medical market, but we have three competing initiatives to determine how our potential adult use or recreational market would look. One of them basically says regulate it like a tomato. One of them is on the opposite side and says, keep forced vertical integration. These 11 license holders will be the only ones that can participate. And then you kind of have that middle ground. And I think a lot of people are in error going toward that middle ground. But to me, that's a scary thing where we should be taking it slow and steady. So like when you look at these ballot initiatives, oh, we're going to allow six plants of home grow recreational with, you know, semi forced vertical integration or, or whatever. And you kind of look at that and you go, well, wait a minute here. You want to codify into law a limitation off the rip that you have no ability to plan for. And we can see that in alcohol prohibition. From the time alcohol prohibition ended in the United States to the time that homebrew was allowed was 84 years. 84 years of stifling industry innovation, of stifling unique growth opportunities, of stifling entrepreneurship. So we saw that there. And to kind of bring us even full circle back toward the green rush and the gold rush thing, you know, some fun statistics, 94 ish, depending on state or country percent of licenses are for cultivation only. Oh, okay. Right. So let's like look at that for a minute. So we have a a market that is 90 plus percent driven toward cultivation. So if we're talking about a potential business model or people trying to jump into the industry, that's when we can talk about our gold rush or or dot com boom thing of like, you know, what's the only company that survived the gold rush and is still functioning today? Well, it's Levi's because Levi's sold (laughs) the stuff to the miners knowing that nine out of 10 of them would fail. It's not that different in business where we have 90% of people are going to cultivation, meaning that if you bring yourself up the value chain, and I'm not saying that everybody should do what we kind of saw in the last couple of years of everybody jump to be a consultant and everybody's an expert. But what I am saying is, is that you can find those ancillary services like extraction or toll processing or hang and dry or cure or analytical testing or transportation. I think, you know, as you see this, a smart play would be to kind of set back and go, where is this chunk in the value chain that services all 10, even if nine fail? Where can I position myself as a company or an ind- individual to capitalize on, on the growth of the industry, but also put myself in a place where you can kind of direct these things? So in a way, it allows you to push, let's use, uh, you know, these vertical integrators and my role at Vanguard. We can sit back and go, guys, I know that you're worried about profits. I know that you're worried about controlling the entire supply chain. But let's sit back and really focus on upregulation. Let's focus on GMP standards. Let's focus on analytical testing. Let's focus on facility design and layout where we can direct this, because at the end of the day, if the grow process and the extraction process are done correctly and well, it doesn't matter how you're selling it in the end you're going to have quality products going out the door. So to me, if you really want to make an effect, you bring yourself back a chunk in the value chain and you get to sit back and you get to kind of direct, even if it's just for a small sliver, you can kind of push toward this eventual goal of longevity, of sustainability, of the highest possible standards. Yeah, and I think people forget that there is just so much more to the industry than just growing or cultivating. And I definitely agree trying to find your niche in the industry or find your place in the supply chain really makes a lot of sense and can give you an upper hand. So actually, how would you like to see the industry enter Europe, having seen it unravel and grow in the US? I would like to see Europe enter as a block. And I would like to see the ability to set up real economics of producer and consumer states. I would like to see import and export, at least within the EU, if not to EU affiliated or countries that come of it. I would really like to see horizontal integration included at the very least as a capability. Even if every single company decides vertical is the way to go, margins are slim, we can do it. I would like the ability to see niche entrepreneurs and very specific sets of things that we didn't get to have in a lot of states in the United States. And kind of lastly, I would like to see Europe take on an educational approach that doesn't put us in a middle ground like we did in the United States. So what we did is we educated people toward indica sativa hybrid. This is a medicine. It's safe. When we could have been 
from the get-go educating toward terpene profiles, toward endocannabinoid system interactions, toward the biopharmacology of it. So I think Europe has that ability to look at all of these things that we did in the States and skip that mistake step and go straight into, okay, guys, let's approach this from a entrepreneur, industry-friendly, quality-first approach based in education and activism. And I know that's a huge thing to unpack, but if I had to put it in a world on a t-shirt, as Michael Budd would say, that's how I would put it. I think you uh, wrapped it up pretty well there. I mean, we here in Europe are lucky enough to be in the position that you guys have done it or you're doing it and that we can actually take lessons from you and see what you've done right and done wrong and try and uh, improve on it. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. That's for sure. So I only have one last question, which I ask all my guests, and that is if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? I don't think so, to be honest. I really don't think I have any things that I had the power of changing. If I had to change one thing, like uh, Magic Wand style, I am, you know, omnipotent. I would have put it into place where force vertical integration is not allowed, where the lobbying efforts could not overcome the activism efforts. I don't know how to do that. I'm not saying I'm the expert in figuring it out. But, you know, if we had to put a magic wand, I would much rather see horizontal integration in every state than see the disparity between states. So horizontal integration, not vertical integration. And if all states could have had it, it would I guess it would have given them a level playing field to work with. And of course, would give many more people the opportunity to actually enter the industry. So yeah, if you'd had that magic wand, I think that would have been a good use of it. So where can our listeners find out more about you, Vanguard Systems, and also uh, Suncoast Normal? Because I also know you work with them as well. I do. So you can find me most easily on LinkedIn, but I also have a website, brettpuffenbarger.com. For Vanguard Scientific and End Solutions, it's vanguardscientific.com. We're also on all the major social media sites. Suncoast Normal is suncoastnormal.org. And LinkedIn. Do LinkedIn. LinkedIn is for weed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. We will help you. Yes. Like people from the States are sitting there on LinkedIn, watching what you guys are doing in Europe, watching the struggles and praying that someone will reach out and go help us understand this or help us make this better because we know what it's like to be in the shoes you guys are all in, watching a nascent industry stand up into its infancy and then eventually grow. A lot of us have been there and we don't want to see the same mistakes repeated because a lot of us care about the plant and the industry as a whole, regardless of who's in taking it, what country it's in. We've gotten to fight the fight, learn from our mistakes. Yes, let's take advantage of the fact that we can learn from your mistakes. I would say that's a good message to end the episode on. Well, Brett, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. That was a truly enjoyable conversation and very insightful. So I'm sure our listeners will learn a lot from it. I know I have. Well, I really appreciated it. You know, I tell everybody I like talking about weed and I like talking about the weed business. So anytime I have an opportunity, I'm always open, especially if it's someone as effable and fun as you are to talk to and hungry to learn. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, you take care, Brett. Likewise. So that was Brett Puffenbarger on the show. I had a real tough time editing the episode down, I must admit, as there was just so much we talked about and so much good content, but I managed. I hope you find it as interesting and informative as I did. Please do make sure to visit Brett's homepage at brettpuffenbarger.com. That's Brett, B-R-E-T-T, double T for Brett, and P-U-F-F-E-N, B-A-R-G-E-R -E for Puffenbarger. And also make sure to check out Vanguard Scientific End-to-End -end Solutions at vanguardscientific.com, especially if extraction is your thing. And do check out Suncoast Normal and all the good work they are doing at suncoastnormal.org. And normal is spelt without an A, so N-O-R-M-L. Please do remember to subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear. And do check out our website at www.smellslikebusiness.com. I've been your host, Tom. Have a green day, everybody. Business. Smells like 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 business.
like business.